good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Edith said, I'm Anita, Anita Karmiki, and I'm an attorney and partner here at Alcorn Immigration Law. Stoked to be speaking with you all today, um, where we're going to be discussing marriage-based immigration options. Um, I love marriage-based immigration. It is where I hold my expertise. Um, as a partner at Alcorn, um, I'm responsible for handling all case types across the board, um, employment-based as well as family-based. But marriage-based and family-based immigration is what really holds my heart. It's just what I really, really love to do. Um, I really love all types of immigration, but I really, really love family-based immigration. So stoked to be speaking you, um, with you all today about what holds a very special place in my heart. Um, at Alcorn Immigration Law, that is who we are, what we do. We overcome borders, expand opportunity, and connect the world by practicing compassionate, cutting edge, and rigorous immigration law in the service of the betterment of humanity. Um, and we do this all while, while priding ourselves um, with, at the very least, a 95% success rate. I honestly think it's higher than that. Um, but the numbers are the numbers. It is what it is. Um, and it's a, been especially difficult over the course of the last four years. Um, well, I guess five years now. Um, and the last past year um, with COVID and all has been ah, never a dull moment is what I like to tell people. Um, this is me, uh, Anita Karikian. I am a partner, a proud um, alumni of UCLA Go Bruins, um, and I went to Santa Clara Law um, for law school. I have experience and expertise in both family law as well as family-based immigration, which oftentimes goes hand in hand. Um, so whenever it comes to reviewing any documents, I'm not switching my screen, thank you, Edith. Um, in terms of in terms of reviewing documents. Um, it's easy for me to take a look at and say, ah, this is not the divorce certificate that we need, or I can easily send over introductions to my newlywed clients or my almost newlywed clients who are interested in perhaps a prenuptial agreement. Um, so the, those expertise go hand in hand. Um, why am I an immigration attorney then if I have this family law experience? Why didn't I just keep practicing family law? Well, I love immigration law. Um, as an immigrant myself, it holds a, a very dear place in my heart. Um, and I am a proud American, I'm super proud American. That's why I practice American immigration law. Um, I am raised Armenian, um, very proud of my heritage. And I was born in Iraq. Um, so as you can see on the next slide, which I'm actually going to switch over to, this is my green card. It's not green, it's pink. Um, I'm considered a resident alien. Little Anita was really offended that she was called an alien. Um, but whatever, it is what it is. Um, so for me, immigration, um, it's very, it's special to me. I was there before. Um, maybe I was younger, so I don't remember every single detail of my journey. But man, have I asked my parents about that journey over and over again. So I've been there before. I lived through it, and I'm grateful that I have. Um, this is our incredible team, without which none of this would be possible. Um, we have a team of experts. Every single one of these smiling faces, most of them are smiling, I'm pretty sure. Um, they are either immigrants themselves, they're the child of an immigrant, the spouse of an immigrant. Um, so it all, again, it all is in our backyard. It's, it's all so close to home to us. So if you love what you do, if you're compassionate at what you do, I believe you're better at what you do. So super grateful for all of these lovely faces on this screen. Um, over here, this is the network that we support, that is supported by us, that we are supported by. Um, so very, very proud of our network as well um, to be from it and to be supported by this, um, this alliance. Dun, dun, dun. What we're here about today. What do you need to know about immigration? Uh, well, other than absolutely everything. That's why you're here, right? Just kidding. You don't have to know everything about immigration. I have to know everything about immigration, um, which is why you're here today. So I can teach you a little bit more about it. Um, so basically, there's two main pathways of immigration. You can either come to the United States first as a visa holder, a temporary visa holder. Then you can potentially eventually get your green card. And then once you've had a green card, for a specific amount of time, then you can graduate to becoming a US citizen. 
or you can enter the United States straight away as a green card holder. Um, and from there, go through the citizenship process as well, if it's something that you're interested in. Um, for example, that, that little pink green card of baby resident alien, Anita, I entered the US right away as a green card holder. My family and I, we never went through first getting a visa and then getting our green cards. We entered the US after being sponsored by my dad's brother under the sibling category. And we came straight away as green card holders. Is one green card better than the other green card? Absolutely not. Um, which is also a bit of what we're going to be discussing today. I'm going to do my best to try to convince you that, hey, if you are in the United States and you have the potential of getting your green card down the employment pathway or the family-based pathway, I'm gonna talk to you and I'm gonna tell you, why not get your green card based off of marriage? Sure, yeah, you can do it yourself through the employment-based categories as well, but why not through the family-based preference category as well? So that's what we're, we're going to be discussing um, a little bit today. I'm going to do what I can to convince you. Immigration during COVID. <sighs> all I can do is sigh. It's been such a fun, fun year for us all. Um, it's been hard for professionals um, in all aspects of, of life. Honestly, healthcare, healthcare professionals, if any of you are out there listening to me today, you, you take the cake on that. It's been the hardest for you. So thank you for all that you do. Um, but it's been really hard in the immigration front as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with the, the difficulties of the immigration front um, as well. But it's been it's been rough. There's been delays across the board with biometrics being scheduled, interviews being scheduled, interviews not being scheduled, interviews being scheduled and then canceled. Goodness gracious, really, there's not been a dull moment in the past. Holy cow, it's been a year and a half now that we've been dealing with all of this. Um, USCIS, the Department of State, the consulates, they have been trying to do everything in their power to navigate through this really difficult time. Um, but there's been delays. Um, some cases are more delayed than others. Sometimes we can kind of push cases along. Other times I have to really just look at my clients and say, my hands are tied. There's nothing that I can do. Your case is going to be scheduled for interview when your case is scheduled for interview. And, and that sadly is what it is. Um, but so kind of a few of the things that, that the government has been doing to accommodate during COVID is that they have been allowing attorneys to appear at local USCIS interviews telephonically. What they're trying to do is limit the body count they're in, that are in their buildings. If there's one less person that doesn't have to be at within their area, within their space, let's not make them be here. Um, so that's pretty progressive, if you ask me, of, of just the different things that the government is trying to do. Um, there have been so many proclamations saying who can enter the United States, who can get their visas at the consulates, who can basically do what um, during COVID. <sighs> it's been hard. Some countries, like for example, if you're entering from the Schengen, Schengen area, um, so from the Europe-ish area, you're going to have to go and quarantine in another country for 14 days potentially before you can enter the United States, or you will need what's called a national interest exception in order for you to enter without any of these proclamations barring entry. So the proclamations that have been functioning as a visa ban, some of them have been lifted. Some of them have kind of shifted from a visa ban to an entry ban. Um, again, we've been navigating this throughout the entirety of this process. For the most part, all of you are already on our Alcor newsletters. Um, if not yet, you're going to be on it now. Um, and with that, we do our best to keep our, our clients, our, our network in the know of what is going on with immigration. Um, so with that, the second all of these travel restrictions, travel bans, um, COVID-related are released, oh boy, will we tell you and we will tell you with such pride that it's not going to be something that we have to deal with anymore. Um, and so while some case types can still be scheduled for interview, other case types, they cannot, or if we need to, um, we can request expedited appointments for given reasons. So if you fall under this category of what is going on, why, am I, why is my case not being scheduled for interview, um, reach out to us, let us know what we can do to help you so that maybe 
you do fall or fall under the exceptions of being able to get an expedited appointment. But needless to say, immigration during COVID, it's been rough. Um, the newest requirement, well, I guess it's, it's not really very new anymore. It's been the case for several, several months now. But in order to gain access into the United States, if you're traveling internationally, regardless of who you are, um, U.S. citizen, green card holder, visa holder, whoever in the world you are, you have to show a negative COVID test in order to seek entry into the United States. Um, people will ask me, well, I'm vaccinated. Do I still need to show a negative COVID test? You absolutely do. And if you're one of those people that you take a COVID test and you test positive, even though you know you don't have COVID, you don't have the symptoms, um, if you can get a letter from a doctor saying that this person is clear to fly, they don't have, they're not contagious, um, then that, that will fly as well. That, that is good to go. The August visa bulletin. Um, the visa bulletin, um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with what the visa bulletin is, it dictates who can get their green card at what point in time given or based on what specific category that they fall into. It is updated on a monthly basis based off of the quotas that are given to specific um, categories of getting your green card from specific countries on a fiscal basis. The USCIS fiscal year starts on October the 1st and ends on September the 30th. Kind of funny, huh? Well, what can we do? Um, that's the fiscal year for USCIS, and that's how all of the visa bulletins are calculated. The visa bulletin um, in August, what we're looking at is, I mean, pretty, pretty basic if you ask me. Um, the F2A category, I think, is the one that is the neatest category to look at. The F2A category is spouses of green card holders. Historically, this category has been backlogged usually by about two to two and a half years. For almost actually two years now, this category has been current, which is incredible because that means that before where it would take a green card holder maybe five years to get their spouse in the United States with them, now it's taking closer to maybe two years um, for them to enter the United States as green card holders. So pretty wonderful if you ask me. Um, other categories that are often looked at is the F4 um, category, which is the sibling category. And up top over here, you will see um, the definition of what all of these preference categories are. The F4 category is the sibling category, which is usually backlogged at least 15 years. I'm not going to do my math right now because I think it's less than 15 years, maybe 13 years. I don't know. I went to law school, so I didn't have to do math. But here I am trying to do math on the fly. It's not a good look for me. Um, but so with that, with all of these different visa preference categories, you'll see, hmm, how come, where is the spouse of a U.S. citizen? Or where is the parent of a U.S. citizen? Well, those categories are not subject to the visa bulletin. They are considered parents of a U.S. citizen, spouses of U.S. citizens. They are exempt from the visa bulletin because they are immediate relatives of a U.S. citizen. That means that there is no requirement of, there's no quota or there's no maximum cap on how many parents of U.S. citizens or um, spouses of U.S. citizens can enter the United States on, a, on an annual basis. So that's pretty cool as well. There is two, as you can see here, can I go back? Oops. There's two different charts. There's chart A and there's chart B. The difference between chart A and chart B is how soon can I submit my documents before I will actually expect to get my green card. So under chart B, if your priority date under chart B is current, that means that the National Visa Center will reach out to you to start getting that information from you sooner. So as you can see under the F2A category, the National Visa Center right now is reaching out to people who filed their applications in June of this year. Um, and then a month later, there's going to be visa availability for them. So fun facts about the visa bulletin. It's kind of confusing, let me tell you. Um, so if you have any questions about the visa bulletin, you know where to find me. Okie dokie. So marriage-based options, that's what we're here about today, right? So there's two different pathways that somebody 
can get their green card. There is an adjustment of status pathway, as well as a consular processing pathway. Adjustment of status are for those who, I'm, I'm going to jump back and forth, but I promise you I will slow down. Adjustment of status are for those who are in the United States. Consular processing are, are for those who are not in the United States. Um, so let's talk in the United States and let's talk marriage to a US citizen because that's what we're here for, right? So let's say I am in the United States. No, I wanna be the US citizen. My fiance can be the non-US citizen. So let's say I'm a US citizen and my fiance is in the United States with another visa um, already of, of, of his own. He's in the US on an F1 student visa. If my fiance is in the United States on an F, actually, I take that back. I don't want the F1. I don't want him to be on an F1 visa. I want him to be on an H1B visa, a dual intent visa. If my fiance is in the United States on an H1B visa and we get married, we actually are getting married in January. So with him and I, with us getting married in January, he has the option of filing a green card based off of our marriage. So who can adjust? Somebody who is currently in the United States in valid status already of their own. Um, cool. Awesome. Well, what if he doesn't have status? What if he entered the United States as a student and dropped out of school? Or what if he was on the, in the United States as a visitor and overstayed? Well, in theory, as long as he entered the United States in valid status and overstayed his visa, which is a no-no. We don't want to violate the terms and conditions of our, our non-immigrant status. We want to always be in valid status. But again, hypothetically speaking, if my fiance entered the United States, or let's call him my husband, my husband entered the United States as a visitor, overstayed his visitor's visa, as long as he never left the United States afterwards, we could still potentially apply for his adjustment of status to get his green card. So it's a possibility. Um, again, if you ever find yourself in this category or if you have questions about it, reach out to me and let's figure out what your options are. Um, how, to get, how do you get your green card through the adjustment of status process? Well, you have to be in the United States with a visa of some sort at some point in time and you have to be here to stay. Um, you file a green card application, um, the adjustment of status application, and you kind of will be landlocked for a while. Um, the funny, it's kind of the funny thing about immigration. Um, we always tell you, don't come and overstay, don't stay here, you have to leave. But if you file a green card application, if you leave, your green card can be considered abandoned. So don't do that. So as you'll see that pathway, um, that chart, which we're going to send to you via email, um, at the end of today's call, um, you get married, you file the green card application. With that green card application, you file um, for what's called your combo card. Your combo card is work authorization and international travel authorization while the green card application is pending. Um, so from there, you have to wait on average right now about six to nine months, maybe actually a little bit longer because of how long um, the delays have been caused by COVID, but usually and typically it's taking about six to eight months after you file that green card application to get that combo card. That combo card is going to give you the ability to travel internationally and work for any employer in, in the United States. Until then, if you travel internationally, your green card is going to be considered abandoned. Subject to a few exceptions, but we're not going to talk exceptions now um, because I don't want to overload on information. Um, but subject to a few exceptions, if you leave the United States, your green card will be considered abandoned. So stay put, don't leave after you file an adjustment of status green card application. Um, and then from there, after you your case is filed and you get the combo card, you're in, it's, it's the waiting game for your case to be scheduled for interview. Your case will be scheduled for interview at a local USCIS office. You will go to that interview and the officer will ask you questions about your marriage. The officer will ask you questions about your eligibility, get your green card. Um, and it's not like what you see in the movies. What was that one Sandra Bullock movie? I really should remember the title of it, but it's not like that movie um, where they separate you and they ask you what side of the bed do you sleep on? What kind of toothpaste does he use? No, the questioning is more so, initially, the questioning is more so, how did you meet? 
who was at your wedding, um, what do you do for fun, kind of just to make sure that on the onset, the officer feels comfortable to say, oh yeah, this is a legitimate couple, it's a bona fide relationship, a good faith marriage. Um, if for whatever reason, the officer has, has reason to believe that it is a sham marriage, that it is a fake marriage, it can escalate to those movie-like interviews where they do separate you. It's called a Stokes interview. They will separate you and they will ask you all of those tough questions. Um, what time does your partner wake up? What time does your partner go to work? Do they take lunch with them? What time do they come home? Who does the cooking? Who does the laundry? How many bedrooms is the house? What is the, um, what is, if you live in an apartment complex, what is the name of the apartment complex? So more of those those difficult questions that, man, unless you're living with that person and are indeed in a good faith relationship, those are going to be hard to answer. Um, sometimes I joke with my parents who've been married for over 40 years now that I don't think that they would pass a Stokes interview, bless their hearts, but the questions are tough. Um, so work with a good attorney who will set you up for success so that you don't have to go down that scarier pathway. Um, have I gone to one of those before? I have. Gosh, they're not fun. So you don't want to go there. Um, but anyway, so you go to that green card interview, assuming everything goes well, um, the officer will be able to either that day, most likely not that day, but then eventually um, approve your green card. Um, and then you get that green card in the mail and boom, you're a green card holder. Pretty exciting. Um, so that's the adjustment of status pathway. With that approval, you will either get a two-year green card or a 10-year green card, which I will discuss briefly at the very end. Um, so hang on tight. Um, the other pathway is consular processing. Let's say I'm in the US and I fall in love with somebody in Armenia. My fiance is in Armenia. Um, he's my husband, actually. I want him to get his green card and he's not in the United States. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to file a consular processing marriage-based green card application for him. So instead of him coming to the United States on a visa um, and then going the green card process, I'm going to just just have them get the green card from the consulate. Remember those two pathways I was talking about? This is pathway number two. You enter the US straight away as a green card holder, which is awesome because with that, you enter the, the US with the permissions to work in the United States right away and travel internationally. You don't have to wait that, that period of waiting for your combo card. You come as a green card holder already. So with that, it's um, a three-step process. This three-step process is first, well, step zero is you have to be married. Um, so step zero, you have to be married. Um, step one is filing an I-130 petition. That I-130 petition is that foundational petition saying I'm a US citizen and I want my husband or my wife or my spouse to get their green card at the consulate. From there, um, we have to provide supporting documents to establish that we are in a good faith relationship. And here documents are going to be more to say that we're on track to having all of these good faith marriage documents. Here's photos of our relationship. Here's proof that I have traveled out to Armenia, for example, to go and visit my, my, my spouse. Um, so once that first step is done and approved, the case will be forwarded to an entity called the National Visa Center, where we provide them with additional information and documents that are requested. And then the third and final step of that process is that the applicant's spouse will be scheduled for interview in their home country. They attend that visa interview, assuming everything at that, that visa interview goes well. And I'm calling it a visa interview because they obtained their immigrant visa, which is the equivalent of a green card. They're not getting a green card. They're getting a stamp in their passport, a little visa foil in their passport. So at the end of the successful interview, the consular officer will say, give me your passport which is usually really scary, right? No, that's a good sign because that means they're going to take the passport, they're going to approve the immigrant visa green card, put the visa foil in their passport, and then eventually within a, a week to three weeks, give the passport back to the applicant. And then that individual has six months to enter the United States as a green card holder. Hooray, pretty awesome, right? So that's the consular processing pathway what if my fiance, what if my husband is not my husband? What if, what if we're not married yet? Well, there's the fiance pathway that you can go down as well. Um, the fiance pathway 
obviously is for fiancés only. You cannot yet be married. And the way that that works is you have to be engaged to a U.S. citizen. It has to be a U.S. citizen. Lawful permanent residents cannot go down the, the fiancé visa pathway. Um, so here you will petition, or let's say again, I'm petitioning for my fiancé to get not his green card, but to get a K-1 fiancé visa. Um, similar steps as the consular processing pathway, you first start off with filing a petition for the fiancé, and then ultimately the fiancé will attend a visa interview for a K-1 visa, not an immigrant visa. This is actually a non-immigrant visa. They get that visa, that K-1 visa, they enter the United States as a K-1 fiancé visa holder. It's a single-use visa. You can use it only one time. You enter the U.S. and it's valid. Your entry period is valid for 90 days. And you have 90 days to get married to the person who petitioned for you. If you don't get married within those 90 days, you're out of luck. You got to go back to your home country. Um, if you do get married within those 90 days, then from there, you go through the same adjustment of status green card process. Um, so the K-1 visa process, um, Oh, I have not been clicking. I'm so sorry. Here's consular processing. And here's my K-1 visa slide. Ugh, I'm so terrible at this. Um, so here, the fiance, here's the process. Um, what are, why would I go, what, what are the differences of the K-1 fiance visa and then the marriage-based process as well? Why would I want to do one over the other? Um, well, they have their, each have their perks and each have their each have their pros and each have their cons. And you kind of have to decide ultimately what is in your best interest, what works best for you um, and, and, and yours and your partner's goals. Um, so here, the difference between the two is kind of really black and white. With the K-1 visa, the pro is, is that you get to be in the United States faster. Um, it is the fast, it's a faster track to be in the United States with your partner as first a fiance and then being married. The con, which is a pretty big con, is you don't get work authorization or travel authorization. With that, you have to wait for your combo card. With that, you can't work in the U.S. or travel internationally until that combo card is approved. And usually that's about a year after you're, you first enter the United States with your K-1 visa. Because if you think timeline, let's, let's call the timeline January 1st, I enter the U.S. with my K-1 visa. I have 90 days, so three whole months to get married. Let's say I wait until that very last day to get married. That leads us to March the 30th, we get married. And then from there, I have to gather everything to file my adjustment of status application. And then from there, I'm waiting six to nine months to get my combo card. Combo card, again, being work and travel authorization. Three plus possibly nine, that's almost a full year um, that I have to wait to have work and travel authorization. For some people, they're like, I don't care. I'm totally fine not working. I'm totally fine not traveling internationally. I just want to be with the person that I love. We can't stand to be separated anymore. Other people are like, heck no, you expect me to not work for a whole year? I can't do that. I will lose my mind. Um, but so that's the that's why they would say, no, I'm going to get married. I'm going to go down the marriage-based process, not the fiance visa process. Obviously, the con of that is you're going to be separated for longer. Um, the marriage-based consular processing route on average takes about 18 months. Um, so the K-1 visa, I guess I didn't really talk timelines. The K-1 visa takes about like 10 to 12 months to be together. Um, again, you enter as a K-1 visa holder, whereas the marriage-based consular processing route takes about 18 months, um, possibly longer. Um, so with that, it's you have to really weigh the pros and cons of what works better for us as a couple. Um, and with that, Ultimately, the K-1 visa process, the whole span of time between starting the process and getting the green card actually does take longer because you have to think of it this way. You're doing the consular processing process 
And after that, you're doing adjustment of status. So by the time you get the green card, it can actually take three, four years to have that green card in hand. But again, the biggest pro is you get to be with your partner um, faster or sooner. So with that, the decision has to be one that's made together um, based off of what your goals are of the relationship. Um, I have a good question that is being asked. Um, can I travel while I'm in the consular process in my home country? Such a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the answer is yes. Regardless of whichever process you're going down, the fiance visa process, the marriage-based process, or even a another work-related, um, employment-related visa process for consular processing. If you have if you come from a country that um, is an ESTA country, or if you have already have a B1, B2 visa, you can still travel into the United States as a visitor. However, you have to make it very, very clear to the, to the customs and border patrol officer who's inspecting you so that they understand your entry is purely temporary. And what better way to prove your temporary intention by a, showing that you have a round-trip flight itinerary. So if you're on ESTA saying, I'm going to be back in my home country in 90 days. Don't worry, um, CBP officer, you, um, here's my round-trip flight itinerary. Or if you have a B1, B2 visa, six months you're granted in order, um, you're granted six months to be in the United States. So number one, super important to have a round-trip flight itinerary. No matter what, if you don't have a round trip flight itinerary, you're going to get turned around. You're going to get turned back. So be ready to present your round trip flight itinerary. Um, plus, you want to show the officer, hey, officer, I have a green card application pending or a K-1 visa um, application pending for me in my home country. I'm not going to risk things. I'm doing things the right way. I have the green card process pending. But man, I just want to come and spend some time with my partner. I want to see what the U.S. is all about. I want to establish my life here. Um, so for the most part, knock on wood, my clients have had no issue with seeking entry as a visitor while their um, consular processing applications are, are going through. Um, so hope that helps. If you have more questions, um, go ahead and, and um, ask them some more. Okay, so think like five minutes ago when I said somebody who has a green card, when, once their green card is approved, you will either get a two-year green card or a 10-year green card. This is all based on when the green card was approved, where, what anniversary had you, had you met in your marriage. If you get your green card before your two-year wedding anniversary, and again, it's your wedding anniversary. So green card before that two-year wedding anniversary, you get a two-year conditional green card. If your green card is approved after your two-year wedding anniversary, you get a full 10-year green card. Now, somebody who gets a two-year green card, yikes, what does that mean? Well, all that means is that there's an additional hurdle that you will have to go through in order to establish that you're still in a good faith marriage, a good faith relationship with your significant other that petitioned for you to get the green card. So with that, it's called an I-751 removal of conditions. Um, and you're removing the conditions of your green card by establishing that you entered your marriage in good faith and that you're still married to that to that individual that petitioned for you. You have a 90 day window to file that application, which is 90 days preceding, meaning before the green card expires up until the date of expiration. So you have to file that removal of conditions during that period of time, or else you can be in a little bit of trouble, meaning you're at a valid status and you're going to have to seek special permission from the government to say, so sorry, I filed this application after it was expired, blah, blah, blah. You don't wanna do that. So make sure that you're filing a timely application, 90 days before the expiration up until day of expiration. And what's pretty cool is that USCIS will actually send you a reminder. If you have a conditional green card, they will send you a notice saying, hey, your green card's expiring. Don't forget to renew it um, by filing an I-751 removal of conditions. If you have a two-year green card, at that two-year expiration, do not file an I-90 renewal of your green card. That is not what you're doing. What you are doing is filing for a removal of conditions, which is an I-751, completely separate application. If you find yourself confused, reach out to me. We will help you. Um, 
Now, a question is, I don't know if I have this in my next slide. I already mentioned this. Um, a question here, I don't know what my, hold on. Got it. Okay, eligibility to file um, or that removal of conditions. Um, you have to file it 90 days prior to the expiration of the green card. Don't forget that, that's super important. Um, you have to file it, you don't have to. If you're filing it together because you're still married, you file it jointly with your spouse. We'll talk about what happens if you're not still married and you just have to prove that you're still in a good faith relationship. Um, and with that, you're just providing additional documents to establish that you're still married happily, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, so with that, whatever documents you filed with the initial applications to support your good faith relationship, bank records, lease agreements, photos, whatever it is you provide uploaded, updated documents of that nature plus anything new that you got maybe you bought a house together maybe you had a baby so sweet whatever it is that you have that has both of your names on it together to establish that that good faith relationship make sure that you give that to the the um the officer with your application the more that you provide the better some people are like but what if i'm going to kill 50 trees in order to provide all of this paper um to the government sorry the u.s government doesn't care about trees, apparently, the more the merrier. Let's provide them as much information as we possibly can so that they could potentially approve your case without interview, which is a possibility for I-751 removal of conditions applications. If you went through the adjustment of status pathway and process and you got your green card in the U.S., then you can possibly not have a second interview with USCIS. If you want the consular processing pathway, inevitably your case will be scheduled for interview um, for the I-751 because they want to, they want applicants to have at least one interview together locally in the United States, which is why adjustment of status usually they're um, not scheduled for interview if the, if you're providing sufficient evidence to establish that good faith, that continued good faith relationship. Um, but if you do the consular processing pathway, you've never gone to a USCIS interview together before. So they're going to schedule you for one. Regardless, we wanna provide as much evidence as we possibly can um, for this process. Um, what happens if the marriage didn't make it? You know, sometimes it, it doesn't make it, it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, if you, th there's a, a handful of people that can apply for an I-751 um, with a waiver. Um, waiver meaning I, fi I got my green card based off of marriage, but I'm not with this person anymore. One is we entered the marriage in good faith, but things didn't work out. We had to get a divorce. One is super sad. My spouse passed away within the, the first two years. Um, another is we entered into this good faith relationship and we're actually still married, but I am the victim of domestic violence. And then the third is it would be extreme hardship if you don't renew my green card. Um, so please waive my requirement to file this with the other individual. So this one, usually it's just the applicant. So the, the green card holding spouse that's requesting the removal of conditions, they're the only ones that is, they're filing this by themselves, basically. Um, so if you, divorce is, is, is the most common um, reason for somebody to file with a waiver. Um, and so if you entered, if you got your green card based off of marriage, and the marriage didn't last, start the divorce process because in order to file with a waiver, you have to have at least started the divorce process. And then you have to go through the divorce process actually pretty quickly because before they can approve the case, they need to know that that divorce has been finalized. Um, so again, these ones are a little bit messier. So make sure that you work with a knowledgeable attorney um, that can guide you throughout this process. All right. Beyond green cards, U.S. citizenship. Um, so if you have been a green card holder and you're interested in U.S. citizenship, um, it's time to be a U.S. citizen. Um, if you are, you can, an individual can either get their green cards in three years or in five years, depending on kind of what, uh, what, the, what the facts are um, of the case. If you are married to a U.S. citizen and have been married to that U.S. citizen spouse, for at least three years, and you've been a green card holder for those three years, you can actually get your, your US citizenship in three years instead of in five years. 
If that is not the case for you, then you have to wait the full five years in order for you to get your to get your green card. So with that, you have to have been a green card holder for either three or five years. You have to been, have been physically present in the United States for at least 50% of the time um, and have no trips outside of the US for more than six months. You have to be a person of good moral character and you have to be inevitably interviewed. Again, maybe this is your third interview with the government, um, but they'll interview you. Um, they'll give you an English reading and writing test. They'll ask you some civics questions. Um, and then after that, you will be sworn in as a US citizen. Um, so here is kind of the breakdown of either, either three years or five years. So again, if you've been married to a US citizen um, for three years, if you've had your green card, been married, for you, been married for three years to a US citizen and been living with that US citizen spouse for three years, you can get your um, US citizenship in three years or if not um, five years is what you will be required to do. And um, from there, these are not, not marriage proposals. <laughs> These are proposals of potential, um, kind of what's, what's in the know, what's happening right now um, with, US citizen, uh, with, with the US Citizenship Act of 2021. Um, ultimately, there's a couple of different bills that are with Congress right now um, that talk about immigration reform, which is super exciting. So with this, um, work-related visa highlights are that the government or what we're trying to do with this reform um, is creating more creating more visa opportunities, clearing green card backlogs, creating new green card pathways, um, making H-4 visas, so spouses of H-1B visa holders, making that EAD for them permanent, um, preventing children from aging out and not being able to get their green cards with their parents, and just various, um, various different uh, economic just development green cards basically saying that, hey, this is a super rural part of California, uh, of the United States. If you want, you can come and live here. We'll give you a green card if you come and live here. So that's a proposal. Um, and then from there, family-wise, um, there's proposals of doing whatever we can to either get families together faster or keep them together. Um, so for those who've completed um, step one of the consular processing pathway, having that I-130 approved, um, this proposal says that Let's let them enter the United States. Let's let them start their lives here. They're on track to anyway. Why are we torturing them from being apart for almost another year after that? Um, another op another um, proposal is eliminating the three-year bars and 10-year bars. So people who have unlawful presence in the United States and then depart, they will be subject to either a three-year bar or a 10-year bar of entry into the US. Um, so um, potentially eliminating those and just other different ways of, of getting people together in the United States. Um, the last one is personally my favorite, of course it is. Um, so stopping the, stop calling immigrants aliens. We are not aliens. Maybe we're a non-citizen, um, maybe we're a non-resident, but we're not aliens, don't call us that. Um, so that is actually already happening, which is pretty cool. Um, and then pathways to citizenship. Um, there's two different pathways of citizenship right now that are with the um, with the House, one is with House and one is with Senate. Um, so both of them are going to give potential opportunities for individuals who are in the United States in some sort of parole status or non-status, um, maybe DACA, TPS, um, basically just un getting these undocumented immigrants on a pathway to citizenship. They're here, they're awesome, um, they're wonderful. Let's get them pathways of citizenship. Um, so with that, um, there's, there's, two different bills, one with House, one with Senate, that, that are providing potential pathways. So fingers crossed for, um, for passing on those. Um, quick little update on DACA. It's frustrating. Um, again, we see that there is a, another halt on new DACA applications. Um, it happened on July 16th more recently. A Texas federal judge said that, um, again, the DACA program is illegal. Um, so USCIS has again paused acceptance of new initial DACA applications um, and requests for um, just employment authorizations. Um, so no new DACA grants. You can still renew one if you are already in DACA status, but if you don't already have DACA, um, um, there's no way for you to get it right now until, again, um, we 
get that lifted. Um, the DREAM Act is, again, one of the, the two pathways of, of citizenship um, for our undocumented individuals. It's three steps. First, you will get a conditional permanent, you, you will get a conditional green card, and then you will get promoted over to being a permanent resident, and then ultimately you can apply for US citizenship. It is a really long pathway. Um, and then this next slide will show you what that pathway um, timeline looks like. It's actually will take over almost 10 years for these individuals to be on a pathway of getting their green card. Um, and here it just kind of specifies the difference between the two bills, one with the House, one with the Senate, um, both super interesting. Um, and as you can see, these individuals will be put through the ringer to make sure that they are they, they qualify to get a conditional green card eventually and then um, one day uh, a permanent green card and then finally US citizenship. Um, all right, so tell us what we can do to support you. Um, that is all my content for today, but consider us a resource. Um, follow us on all of our social medias. You should have already, you should already be receiving our newsletters, um, but we have a podcast. Subscribe to our podcast. We have a new episode every Tuesday. Um, I'm often a guest on it um, and I we, we do interviews. So it's a pretty good podcast. Um, at the end of today's um Today's webinar, we will be sending out, I believe, a recording of today's episode as well, uh, today's webinar, as well as various handouts and resources that we can send um, that you hopefully will find helpful. Um, if anybody has any case specific inquiries, please feel free to reach out to us um, at the contact information on this slide so that we can schedule a formal consultation with you so that we can ask or answer any questions that you have about your case specifically. Um, Keep in mind that there are options, and I encourage you to pick our brains about creative, creative, resourceful immigration options that you and your loved ones can benefit from on both employment aspect, the employment side of it, as well as the family side of it as well. Um, let's go ahead and answer some more of your questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A and I will go through and I will answer them for you. Again, don't forget, nothing that I say right now is confidential. So if you have anything case specific, um, let's reach out to me separately and we'll, we'll schedule a call for you. Um, next question, is there a difference between filing the I-130 online and by mail? Is by mail in any way preferred? There's really no difference. Um, we're, what I've heard anecdotally is that those um, applications that are filed, the I-130s that are filed online is a faster processing between the national, between USCIS, the first agency that gets the file over to the National Visa Center, which is the second government agency that will get the file. So what I'm hearing is that that process is more seamless Whereas if you do a mail filing, it can take a couple of weeks as opposed to a couple of days. Um, we are toying around and we've been filing our applications online. Um, some of them will file online, some of them will still do um, the formal paper, paper way. But if you're going to be filing it on your own, um, see if you can do it online. Um, how long does it take to receive a K-1 fiance visa right now? That one is a very big sigh. I've been sighing a lot. I sigh a lot just in general. Um, but right now, that is a difficult question for me to answer. Um, Pre-COVID, I can give you that answer. Pre-COVID, it was taking about a year. No, I'm sorry. It was Pre-COVID, it was taking about anywhere between eight to 12 months for somebody to get their K-1 fiance visa and enter into the United States. Um, again, this is pre-COVID. Post-COVID, my K-1 fiancés are stuck. They are stuck in a holding pattern because remember all of those proclamations that I was telling you about and there's exceptions that are made for, for some people. Well, some people is not a fiancé of a U.S. citizen. So the spouse of a U.S. citizen, if you're married to a U.S. citizen, you are not subject to the bans to the proclamations, to any of the the require the any of those things that are saying you can't enter the U.S., you can't have a green card right now, you can't have your case scheduled for interview. My spouses of U.S. citizens are not subject to any of that, so their cases are moving along fairly quickly. My fiance visas they are 
currently very much struggling to get their cases either scheduled for interview or moving along. There's various, um, there's a lot of litigation that's going on right now for K-1 fiancé visa holders um, or those who are waiting for their cases to be scheduled for interview. Um, so it, it's a tough time right now to, to file a K-1 fiancé visa. So if somebody fresh reaches out to me and says, hey, I'm considering either a K-1 fiancé visa or a marriage-based consular processing application, I will tell you, go get married. Don't mess around with a K-1 visa right now because I don't know when the world is going to go back to normal um, with COVID in mind. Um, so how long does it take to receive a K-1 fiancé visa right now? I very sadly don't have an answer to that question um, because it's it's really difficult right now. Um, I would hope I would maybe approximate a year, um, but you can't hold me to that because, again, COVID has thrown a really, really big wrench um, in all of immigration, um, making it especially difficult for fiancés right now. All right, I see no new questions trickling in. Um, again, please consider me a resource. Please consider all of us at Alcorn Immigration a resource. If there's absolutely anything that we can do to support you throughout your immigration journey, to support your family members, to support a colleague, whatever, um, feel free to reach out to us um, and let us know what we can do to help you. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and have a good day. Bye.